Hello, I'm Stephen Benz, and I've written a book, a new book with Ave Maria Press that I'd like to tell you about, and then walk you through one of the prayer experiences of this book. Through my work in biblical studies through the years, I've, I've grown to appreciate the rich tradition of Lexio Divina, an ancient way of experiencing scripture as the word of God. And then, through my work in leading pilgrimages to the lands of the Bible, I've begun to experience the ways in which both sacred text and sacred images express God's living word. I've discovered that the tradition of meditative reading of scripture and that of meditative gazing through icons can lead Christians to a, a fuller experience of God's living word. So I've written this book, Transformed by God's Word, Discovering the Power of Lexio and Visio Divina, joining the, the rich traditions of Western and Eastern Christianity. This holistic experience of God's Word encourages a, a multi-sensory experience of, of the Divine Word that will lead us more completely into the heart of Jesus Christ. Just as the early Christians began writing about the good news of Jesus Christ, they began to express this good news also in images. The same impulse that moved writers to communicate the Gospel with, with ink on parchment also moved artists to express the gospel with paint on wood and plaster. And just as the, the sacred images began to be read in the church's liturgy, so the imagery of the church began to form part of the sacred space for, for worship in house churches and shrines and catacombs. So we can be attentive to the mysteries of God's word both by listening to the scriptures and by gazing at icons. The inspired texts and the holy icons reproduced in this book invite us to both listen and to see deeply. And the purpose of both scripture and icon is to make us present to the saving event. Through both sacred text and sacred image, the grace of the saving event and its transformative power become present and, and available to us now as we listen and as we gaze. By listening and gazing, both listening and gazing require our complete attention. Saint Benedict, who set the tone for the spirituality of Western Christianity, urged his followers to listen to God's word with the ear of the heart. And the Byzantine writers of the East focused on gazing as Paul says in Ephesians, with the eyes of the heart. So, I'd like you to take you through a brief experience using the text and the icon for the ascension of Jesus Christ, one of the 20 gospel experiences contained in this book. I'll walk with you through the movements of this practice. First, Lexio, listening carefully to the text of Scripture, then visio, gazing on the icon. And then we'll move into an experience of reflecting on the text and the image together. This will then lead us into prayer and contemplation. And finally, we'll think about the ways that this experience has been transformative for us. So, let's then listen to these texts trying to, to hear them in a new way, trusting that God is working within us through the Holy Spirit. First, from the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took them, took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, 
from the letter to the Hebrews. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made of human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For when he would have had to suffer, for then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The ascension represents a moment of transition in the New Testament, the movement from the story of Jesus to the story of the church. The disciples recognize that the one who has taught, healed, and loved them will no longer be seen by them, but will be present nonetheless. The fuller meaning of this mystery of the ascension is beyond what can visually be seen or verbally expressed. The letter to the Hebrews teaches us that Jesus entered into the heavenly sanctuary, the celestial counterpart to the earthly Jerusalem, the earthly temple in Jerusalem. There, beyond the bounds of time, Jesus is forever offering the sacrifice of himself for the sins of the world. He's continually interceding for us through the once and for all sacrifice he offered on the cross. Through the church's Eucharistic liturgy, his perfect sacrifice is made present and transformative for us here and now. And so, while Jesus reigns in the heavenly temple, his earthly work continues in the church until he returns. Jesus has given his disciples a mission. When the Spirit comes upon them, they will be witnesses of Jesus first in Jerusalem, then in the neighboring regions, and then to the ends of the earth. But they must wait for the power of the Spirit, because the same Spirit who empowered Jesus will be present in his church. You know, Moses and Elijah, who appeared with Jesus at his transfiguration, each transmitted their own spirit to their successors at their departure. Because Moses laid his hands on Joshua, his successor, Joshua was filled with wisdom and did as God had commanded to Moses. Before Elijah ascended into heaven, Elisha asked for a double share of his spirit. So when Elijah departed, his spirit became active in his successor. Well, likewise, when Jesus departs, he promises the Holy Spirit to his church so that the, his saving work will continue in the world. The two men in white robes warn the disciples not to stand looking toward heaven because they have a task ahead of them, the mission of the church, the evangelizing, the evangelization of the world. Now, we gaze upon the icon, letting the image invite us into the scene. The icon reveals more than I can see, inviting us into a fuller understanding of the ascension of Christ. The holy image does more than tell the story in a picture. It evokes from us a deeper grasp of the mystery a better comprehension of Christ's heavenly ministry, and a desire to join the disciples in the work of the church. So we see the upper part of the icon presents the glorified Christ. The divine orb encloses Jesus, expressing his heavenly abode. 
the duality of matter and spirit, of human and divine, heaven and earth, is unified in the glorified Christ. The orb represents the glory and the majesty of Christ beyond what can be physically witnessed by the gathered disciples and beyond what can be expressed even in the inspired words of Scripture. Christ is the new creation, the fullness of which we will experience when Christ comes in glory. Then the lower part of the icon portrays the disciples in confusion and in wonder. In their midst stands two men in white robes. And although they point upward, their message to the, to the disciples points them outward toward their mission as witnesses to the ends of the earth. Think about their call to us to await the return of Jesus by being followers of Jesus in the world. And in the center stands Mary, the mother of the disciples and of the church. She's not staring upward, but lovingly toward us. There's serenity in her face and acceptance in her gestures. She understands better than ever the mysteries of her son's birth, death, and resurrection, already hoping for his return. This hope gives her true wisdom and peace. Let the face of Mary offer you wisdom to comprehend the meaning of the mystery. So the icon depicts the timeless church. You see, although Paul was not yet a Christian at the historical moment of the ascension, he's present in the icon, the figure just to the right of Mary and the angel. He is the counterpart to Peter on the left. Peter and Paul, they are the two pillars in the Acts of the Apostles. And along with the other ten apostles, they represent the disciples in transition crossing over from their life with Jesus to the beginnings of the church. So now having listened to the text and gazing upon the icon, we move into meditation. The disciples in the icon are presented in a state of, of transition and confusion shown by their gestures and the fact that they're not portrayed with halos. What might be some of the reasons for their confusion and their lack of order and harmony? The text of the letter to the Hebrews expresses the goal of Christ's ascension in a timeless way. It says that Christ entered into heaven to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. In what ways does Christ intercede on our behalf? How do these words of Hebrews deepen your understanding of the ascension? Contrasts the disciples in the icon to the image of Mary. She wears a halo standing directly beneath the image of Christ and is the only figure looking directly at us. She's not only the mother of the Savior, the bridge that brought divinity to humanity, but now she's also the mother of his church, bringing humanity to divinity. What are some ways that Mary fulfills her role as mother in your own life? The final words of Jesus before his ascension tell his disciples that the Holy Spirit is coming upon them 
and that they will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. In what ways is the church expressing these words of Jesus today? And in what way are you called to enter in? In what ways do both the text and the icon of the Ascension confirm or enhance your understanding of the purpose and the mission of the church? So after having reflected a bit on the text and the icon, we move into an experience of prayer. After we hear and see the living Word of God, we respond to that Word in our own words. I'll pray the words that I have written and then give you a moment to continue the prayer in your heart. Risen and glorious Lord, who has ascended to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, Give us the desire to worship you and the courage to be a witness to the good news you have brought to the world. Help us to do your will on earth as it is done in heaven until you come in glory. And then, after a while, words become unnecessary in prayer, and so we are led by God's Spirit into contemplation, which is simply resting in God. Look at the face of Mary in the icon, and let her serene acceptance lead you into wordless contemplative prayer. Place your own heart in the heart of Mary. Spend some moments in silence, praying for a spirit of joyful trust and confident expectation. Finally then, we consider how this experience of God's Word is making a difference in our lives. Your prayerful reflection gradually transforms you into a disciple sent by Jesus to embody divine love, to teach and to heal, to comfort and bring peace. In what direction is the Lord sending you today? So, that's it. The experience of Lexio and Visio Divina. You know, we are a word of God. We are made in the image of God. And the more we come to know God through his living word, the more we grow to know and understand ourselves because we begin to see ourselves through the eyes of God. So, this practice of experiencing God's word through word and image gradually transforms us into the image of God, leading us into the mind and heart of Christ, allowing us to share in the very nature of God. So thank you for, for sharing this experience with me. So now I invite you to take up this book yourself and experience the 20 texts and icons within it.